Hello. Welcome. Uh, my name is Bruce, and I am here with Mini PCR Bio today to talk to you about the environmental DNA analysis project identifying antibiotic resistance. Uh, we're really excited to present this to you in collaboration with PEAR, the prevalence for antibiotic resistance in the environment project. Uh, this is something that we've worked on in collaboration with them. It's actually our second uh, lab that we've done in collaboration with them, and we're, we're really excited to present it to you today and, and finally get this into the hands of more people. If you're not familiar with Mini PCR Bio, we make biotechnology equipment, uh, specifically small, robust equipment that's great for the field or the classroom. Uh, but we also realize that if you're putting uh, biotechnology equipment in the classrooms, uh, the equipment's only as good as the activities that you have to do with it. So we spend a lot of time trying to think of innovative, meaningful activities uh, that you can do with your students. And uh, that's what we're going to present to you today. So as I said, we're doing this with collaboration in collaboration with PEAR. Uh, so the prevalence of antibiotic resistance in the environment. Uh, this is a quote from their website there, student researchers as global stewards, the prevalence of antibiotic resistance in the environment project engages students in a global antimicrobial resistance surveillance. Um, really, the spread of antibiotic resistance is one of the great public health challenges of the 21st century. And the PEAR project uh, tries to engage students and student researchers in tackling that project head on. And in, in joining the PEAR project and doing some of these activities, you can be part of the solution to some of these problems. You can, you can be part of tackling these problems head on. The PEAR, PEAR does this through a few mo modules. Um, their core module that they've been doing for a while actually has students go out and culture bacteria. That involves um, a little bit more higher certification uh, for your lab than most high schools have. So that's usually done at, a, at the college level. But so uh, then in expanding their reach, they've also come up with several case studies and molecular approaches. And so this molecular approach is, is one that we're going to talk about today that really looks to get uh, this ability to surveil the environment into more folks' hands. Real quick, I just want to note that what we're talking about today is a fairly advanced lab. You know, at Mini PCR Bio, we, we try to make, you know, really robust labs that work great in a 45 minute lab period with eight lab groups. Um, if you're looking for that, we have lots of labs like that. This is a little less so. Uh, it, it requires some more advanced equipment, a cell disruptor, a vortex mix, mixer, a microcentrifuge, more micropipettes than a lot of times uh, we require for our labs. It's going to take several lab periods. And then importantly, uh, in doing this, there's a good chance that you get negative results. That's actually a, a perfectly valid and, and a, a, a good result to see. Um, however, for if this is, you know, the one molecular lab you're doing for the year, that can be a little disappointing if all you see is molecular uh, negative results. So just if, if seeing all that gives you any pause, please stick around for this whole thing. However, we do have another lab. Uh, this is our first collaboration. Uh, with the PEAR project, the Antibiotic Resistance Lab Monitoring Resistant Organisms in the Environment. Uh, this is a case study approach that gives, we provide the DNA with known results, so it gives a very robust results. And uh, actually, some colleges have taken this up. They'll, they'll do this before they do the more advanced ones to give students a little bit more context and a little bit more experience in the lab. Um, so again, if this interests you, uh, we have sort of the, the easier, uh, ready-to-go version. And today we're going to be talking about uh, sort of the slightly more advanced, um, sort of open-ended version. So let's get going. What we're going to talk about today, uh, we're going to talk about what is environmental DNA? How is it used? Then we're going to talk a lot about just what are antibiotics and antibiotic resistance. We're going to talk about uh, why this antibiotic resistance in the environment uh, is a concern. I'm actually going to test some soil, and we'll see those results uh, today. And then finally, we'll discuss what all this means. I, before I get, really get going, I just want to say I am not a microbial uh, ecologist. Uh, this has been done in collaboration with microbial ecologists, however. So. Uh, we're confident with what we're presenting. Um, and as we go, uh, if you have any questions, uh, we have folks in the chat. Please just shout them out there. We will do our best to answer them. Uh, all right, so let's dive in. 
So let's first just talk about what environmental DNA is, because this is a tool, the tool that we're going to use for this lab, and it's a tool that's really opened up um, DNA analysis to some really interesting questions and uses that hasn't been available previously. So when you think of environmental DNA, I, I don't know why I always think of a stream in the woods, uh, but this stream in the woods uh, has tons of DNA in it all over the place. If you look in the soil, in the mud, all sorts of places. And that's because DNA starts out in an organism, but it doesn't always stay there, right? And you know this if you're familiar with your, you know, crime TV shows, right? You can track where the criminal's been by swabbing things and finding out if their DNA is there. That's true for every single organism, right? Everything sloughs off cells. Anything you touch, uh, cells come off and those have DNA in it and that DNA enters the environment. A major thing is, is feces. Lots of organisms poop in the environment. That uh, feces is filled with their DNA. It's filled with the DNA of everything they ate. That's going to all enter uh, soils and waters. Uh, there's mucus. If you're a fish swimming through this water, it's covered with mucus membranes that, uh, mucus, uh, secreted by membranes is going to have some DNA in it that's going to wash off. Gametes. Uh, tons of organisms have external fertilization. You can, again, think of fish in this stream. You can think of pollen. You know, there's, there's times you can watch the wind blow pollen off trees. That's just releasing DNA out into the environment in every single one of those pollen grains. And then finally, there's tons of dead and decaying organisms. You know, every leaf that falls into the stream decays is going to be releasing DNA as it goes. And that DNA won't be gigantic, you know, whole genomes. It will degrade over time, but it takes some time to degrade. Sometimes it's fairly quickly. Sometimes it can be a very long time. But if you're there in that time that it's still around, you can find it. And then I just want to point out, this is often what we think of with environmental DNA are all these sort of released in the environment DNA. What we're going to be looking at today are things that are actually alive. So living microorganisms, right? This stream, the soil, it is filled with bacteria, with protists, things you can't see, but if you strain it, you can get their DNA and learn all sorts, about, uh, all sorts of things about the microbial ecology that's going on there. So real quickly, you know, if you think of environmental DNA, I usually think of, uh, when I think of collecting DNA, I think of you go to the organism and you get the DNA. Environmental DNA, you do the opposite. You go to a place, get the DNA, and then find out what organism it came from. So we, you know, filter the river, we uh, extract DNA from the mud or the soil. And if we did that, you know, we would learn that this, uh, a fish lived there. We would learn uh, that, you know, upstream there was some moss that, that uh, that's DNA was washing into the uh, stream. We'd learn there's specific insects there. And of course, again, uh, importantly, we'll learn that there's tons of different bacteria and other microbes in this environment. eDNA has really opened up uh, some questions that can be answered much more easily and uh, in, in new ways than ever you ever could before. Um, the most basic thing that folks ask though is what lives here. Right? And in that, it's great for measuring biodiversity. And that's sort of the example I, I just gave, but I'll give you another one here. Um, these are the islands off of uh, the Santa Cruz Islands off of California. They're a marine reserve. Uh, as a marine reserve, they want to know what's living there. And so the old way to categorize the fish that lived there was you put on a scuba suit and you went down with a clipboard and you, you watched and you wrote down everything that you saw. Researchers are now just filtering the water. And they found, um, you know, at least initial results suggest that they're finding twice as many organisms through DNA analysis than they, are, than they were by just looking, right? So it, it can be much more sensitive in seeing what lives there. Um, another use is monitoring for invasive species. So my favorite example for this is the zebra and the quagga mussels. These are invasive species that uh, originated in sort of central Eurasia. Uh, they're freshwater mussels that are uh, colonizing North American waters and really wreaking havoc on these uh, ecosystems where they are. They just sort of grow over all sorts of the native, um, the native flora and fauna. And uh, they're a big problem. And you can see here, this from the USGS, they put a lot of effort into mapping where they are so they can map where they are and hopefully 
hopefully eradicate them. Uh, the old way to do that is you go with a net and you scrape along, you get kicked into the net and you look and you see if you see them. Uh, it's labor intensive and it's also easy to miss them. Now you can just go and uh, filter some water and in a stream you can find out everything that's upstream, uh, what, whether these mussels are there or not. And they found that it's, it's actually much more sensitive and much less labor intensive. Um, finally, identifying rare or hard to find organisms. You know, imagine if your study organism is a nocturnal cave salamander or something like that, uh, right? Incredibly hard to find. You can go swab the environment, find out if it's there. Uh, my fun example for this though is what's, what's rarer or harder to find than extinct animals. Uh, so these are folks actually looking for Neanderthals. It used to be if you wanted to study Neanderthals, you had to find a bone. Uh, and, you know, for a long time, you just talked about the shape of the bone in comparison to other things. Now people are going and actually excavating soil and getting Neanderthal DNA directly from the soil. And we can learn about their genetics. We can learn where they lived without ever finding actual, you know, physical evidence that you can hold in your hands. Today, we're doing something slightly different. Today, we're going to look for a specific gene. Um, and so. In today's activity, we're not actually going to know what specific organism that gene was in, but we are going to be able to say, is this gene that we're very concerned about in the environment? Uh, and this, again, is it's a really uh, it's a really useful way to go about it, and it can be much less labor intensive than the traditional methods if you're looking for bacteria of actually trying to culture things. Here we can take the DNA and uh, and find um, you know, evidence for antibiotic resistance in much more widely and much more quickly. So to get into this, uh, let's talk about what antibiotics are and what antibiotic resistance is and why it spreads. So antibiotics are drugs that are toxic to bacteria, but not animals. Uh, they work in uh, many different mechanisms. They may inhibit uh, you know, DNA replication. They may uh, inhibit cell wall formation so the bacteria dies, many uh, inhibit translation so the bacteria can't um, make proteins. Uh, importantly, you know, each uh, antibiotic works a different way, so each antibiotic has a different mechanism. And they're incredibly important, right? They are the wonder drug of the 20th century. Uh, according to the CDC, they may save as many as 200,000 lives every single year in the United States. And, they've, and in doing that, they've added an average of five to 10 years of life expectancy. Um, I mean, that's incredible. That's just a tremendous change in public health that happened you know, at the, in the middle of the 20th century there. We're going to be talking today about tetracycline. We're using this sort of our, as our example antibiotic, and it's the one that we'll be looking for uh, resistance to today. Um, so tetracycline is a common and widely used antibiotic that was first patented in 1953, uh, and it works by binding to the bacterial ribosome and blocking protein synthesis. So just to give you an idea how this works, oh, before we get there, just really, it's, it's broadly effective against microbes. It works against many, many types of microbes, and it's very low toxicity to animals. So that means just generally it's a good antibiotic. So I'm going to show you how it works here, because we're going to go on to talk about antibiotic resistance and how that functions. Um, so this is our cell membrane, and inside the cell membrane we have our ribosome here. This is our uh, mRNA, and we're going. We have our tRNAs producing a protein. And just to be clear, none of this is to scale. This is just for uh, illustration purposes. When tetracycline is in the cell, uh, tetracycline molecules bind to the ribosome, right at the point where the uh, tRNA enters to bind, and so it inhibits that. It, it blocks new tRNAs from entering and the ribosome and binding to the mRNA properly, and that inhibits translation. So when tetracycline is in the cell, uh, the cell can no longer make proteins, or it's at least greatly inhibited in making proteins, and that will lead to cell death. 
So that's the antibiotic, but we're, we're really talking about today is antibiotic resistance. So if antibiotics kill bacteria, that means that there's a, this huge selective pressure in terms of natural selection, that if any bacteria are resistant to the antibiotic, it's just much more likely to survive and reproduce in the presence of that antibiotic. So this one bacteria had a slightly different DNA sequence or had a DNA element that was in it that was different than all the other bacteria. When you took the antibiotic, that's the one that survives and it's going to go on to reproduce. And now you've enriched that population for antibiotic resistance. So now natural selection uh, is going to ensure that the things that survive are the things with the genetic elements that provide antibiotic resistance. And this is important because now when you go back later uh, and you treat with antibiotics again, uh, of course, now this antibiotic resistance uh, gene has spread. And now when you use the antibiotics, it's just much less effective. And we use antibiotics a lot, right? I'm sure that all of us have been on antibiotics multiple times in our lifetimes. So humans are just continually re-enriching these populations for antibiotic resistance. And this really is, I mean, I think one of the prime examples of natural selection. It's, it's one that we have seen happen in human lifespan. Uh, in under 100 years, we've gone from virtually no antibiotic resistance in bacterial pathogens, at least not in any you know, worrisome sense from, from a clinical perspective, to widespread resistance to almost all drugs. Now, that doesn't mean that, that all pathogens are antibiotic resistance, but it means that there are antibiotic resistance genes uh, spreading for almost every drug that we know. So jumping back to tetracycline, this has been widely used in both humans and animals, and we'll talk about why the animals are so important in a, in a little bit, um, for a long time. And there are now over 40 known tetracycline resistant genes that are spreading in the environment. Over 40 different genetic elements that can cause tetracycline to no longer be effective. Today we're going to talk about two of them in detail. And this lab is going to be looking for these two specific antibiotic resistance genes, TET-A and TET-M. Uh, TET-A codes for the TET-A protein. It's a gene that codes the TET-A protein. It provides resistance to tetracycline and other related antibiotics. Tetracycline is sort of a class of related antibiotics. Um, and it codes for an efflux pump. We'll talk about what that means in just one second. TET-M, the TET-M gene codes for the TET-M protein. And that protein provides resistance to likewise tetracycline and, and other related antibiotics. And it inhibits tetracycline by binding to the ribosome in a way that inhibits tetracycline function. So let's look at this again. Again, in the presence of tetracycline, tetracycline binds to the ribosome and that disrupts translation. Um, however, if a cell has TET-A in it, it makes these pumps, these efflux pumps, and these efflux pumps get uh, inserted into the bacterial membrane and they actively pump tetracycline out of the cell. So when TET-A, that when that gene is present in a bacteria, these pumps will be present and the tetracycline levels are kept to a low enough level that is no longer toxic to the bacteria. It just moves them right out of the cell. TET-M works differently. TET-M codes for a protein that binds to the ribosome. So remember that uh, in this illustration, uh, our tetracycline binded, uh, bound right there. Well, TET-M is a small protein that also binds right there. However, it doesn't inhibit translation. And so now when tet, uh, tetracycline you know, floats by in the cell, there's no longer anything there to bind to. And it's, the cell still has tetracycline in it. It's just no longer toxic because that binding site is now protected. So really importantly, uh, what, I, what I'm trying to convey with this is that there's all sorts of different antibiotics. Each antibiotic works very specifically. There's also 
to those antibiotics, there's different ways that they can uh, that there can be resistance, and each resistance gene converts resistance to a specific antibiotic in a very specific way. So, with that description, um, it makes sense. I can see why when I take antibiotics, right, why I may enrich uh, the the population in myself for those antibiotic resistance genes. But we're going to talk today about environmental DNA. So what I want to talk about now is why we think testing soil uh, is a concern. So this comes back to the fact that antibiotics are mostly discovered. Uh, you can think penicillin in mold. This is also true for tetracycline. Tetracycline was discovered in a bacteria, I believe in the soil in Missouri. Um, but, but we're going to use penicillin for this example. Uh, penicillin right, comes from the penicillium mold famously discovered by Alexander Fleming in 1928. That means that penis, the penicillium mold uh, has been around for a long time. I, I mean, I actually, I don't know how long, but I am confident in saying many millions of years, there's been penicillium mold around that has been producing penicillin. That means that any bacteria that live in close proximity to the penicillium mold are under a natural selection pressure to be resistant to that antibiotic. And so as long as the penicillium mold has been around, bacteria that are able to survive and reproduce in the presence of that mold, and therefore in the presence of penicillin, will be more successful, and they will have a selective advantage against other bacteria. So antibiotic resistance genes have been evolving for a long, long time long time. We've been using antibiotics for less than 100 years, but these genes have been evolving for millions of years, many millions of years. To drive this home, it, the first penicillin-resistant bacteria were discovered before penicillin was used clinically. So uh, Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin in uh, 1928. It took till about 1942 to 1945, depending on how you qualify this but when penicillin was mass produced and uh, widely distributed, the first resistant bacteria was actually discovered in 1940, before it was widely used. It's because that e resistance already existed uh, long before Alexander Fleming found penicillin. What we get nervous about is an antibiotic resistance spreading. Because spreading is something that happens more often than a bacteria developing a new resistance sort of de novo, just from, from scratch. I want to be clear, certainly that happens, and that is a concerning thing when it does happen. There are plenty of examples of antibiotic resistance that happened uh, in bacteria developing a new, um, a, a new form of resistance. What we're talking about today, and what, what tends to really concern people, is this spread. Um, from a bacteria that has had resistance for a very, very long time, into new classes of bacteria, such as pathogens, that now are resistant to the antibiotics that we try to treat them with. This happens because bacteria pass on uh, genetic elements in ways that uh, may be unfamiliar to you if you're more familiar with uh, you know, eukaryotic reproduction. So vertical transmission is when something passes on its DNA just through standard reproduction. And in a bacteria, when it divides into two cells, uh, both cells will get the DNA that's from it. That's vertical transmission. There's also horizontal transmission, where this bacteria here has this genetic element, and this completely unrelated type of bacteria over here does not. In horizontal transmission, the DNA goes from one type to another, not through reproduction. And this is something that bacteria do with somewhat uh, regular frequency. Now, the thing is, once this is passed horizontally, once this new bacteria reproduces, now we have two populations that have this genetic element. And if it's something like antibiotic resistance and we're using antibiotics, once this population here is enriched for this antibiotic resistance gene, it makes it even more likely that it's going to get passed on to a new population. 
because the more common a genetic element is, the more likely it's going to be passed horizontally. So the more we use antibiotics, the more likely they're going to get passed to new organisms. And this is important because antibiotics don't target pathogens. We use them when we have a pathogen, right? But they are not, but they kill broadly. When you get something like strep throat and you, you know, take your antibiotic, you're hoping to kill the bacteria that's making you sick. But your body is filled with trillions of bacteria. And depending on the drug and depending on the bacteria, virtually all of them could be killed by that antibiotic. That means that all the bacteria in your system, not just that pathogen, are under pressure to survive and reproduce in the presence of the antibiotics. So when we take antibiotics, we are not just enriching pathogenic populations for antibiotic resistance genes, we are enriching all bacterial populations for antibiotic resistance genes. And that's important because bacteria don't stay in your body forever, right? You are a little bit more of a, a transient vessel for the bacteria in them. You pass them out of you quite regularly, and you take in new ones as well. Uh, so for humans, uh, places like wastewater treatment plants that gather all of our waste together are actually filled with all sorts of different antibiotic resistant bacteria with all sorts of genetic and, uh, elements for antibiotic resistance that all have the potential to spread. And likewise, uh, the antibiotics that you don't take don't stay in your body forever either. Uh, it's estimated between 40 and 90% of the antibiotics that you take pass through you, either through your urine or through your feces. Which means that, uh, again, something like a, a wastewater treatment plant is not getting also is not just getting tons of populations mixing all these populations of bacteria that potentially have antibiotic resistance. They're also mixing all these antibiotics, uh, and so it's a, it's a place where um, antibiotic resistance, the enrichment of populations of antibiotic resistance bacteria, could be happening all the time. Just to be clear with wastewater treatment, clearly they are treating the wastewater so that all of that doesn't get dumped in the environment. Um, but the effluent that comes out is, it's not sterile. There definitely are bacteria in it. Uh, there definitely is DNA in it that comes out. And um, so that is a concern. What people are also very concerned about though are livestock, uh, you know, our cows, our pigs, chickens. Uh, they get fed antibiotics all the time. In fact, uh, for a very long time, it was just regular practice to put antibiotics in animal feed. Uh, that was done as a preventative measure so that animals wouldn't get sick. And also because uh, for reasons that people aren't exactly clear about, taking antibiotics tends to increase growth rate. So if you feed your cows lots of antibiotics, you get them to market larger, and you get them there faster. Um, so there's tons of animals like this that have spent their entire life on antibiotics, enriching populations inside them for antibiotic resistance genes. And really importantly, animal waste uh, much more easily enters the environment. Now, certainly farms uh, you know, process their waste and, and uh, clean up their waste some, but certainly not to the extent of you know, going, taking it all in a toilet to a wastewater treatment plant. There's tons of runoff. There's just tons more opportunity for this uh, waste and these antibiotics and this antibiotic uh, bacteria to be entering the environment from these places. So with that, I'm going to test some soil. Now, the fun thing about this lab is that you can go out and test wherever you want. And with that, you can take a real like hypothesis driven approach, or you can just sort of survey. Maybe you want to go places that you think are really likely to find it. Maybe you want to go places that you think it's unlikely to find it. Maybe you just want to test, uh, you know, a circle around your house and just see if it's there. Um, so in doing that, I took sort of a, a loosely hypothesis-driven approach. I'm gonna, I took uh, four sampling places. I sampled four places. Uh, two based on places that, through what I just talked about, I thought maybe were more likely to have antibiotic resistance. And then two that I thought, well, maybe were, were less likely to have antibiotic resistance uh, gene spreading. 
So the first place I went was to the Seekonk River. Uh, I live in Rhode Island, and so the Seekonk River is the border between uh, the city of Providence here and the city of East Providence here. Uh, I went to Swan Point Cemetery, which is a lovely horticultural cemetery on the east side of Providence, and I went right down to Swan Point uh, right here. And I took a little soil mud from here. Now, just to be clear, uh, the, the lab tests soil, so we're not filtering water, but I took um, some soil or sediment here that clearly is at the water's edge and clearly gets wet from the river uh, regularly. Now, I, I took the soil not because of the beauty of Swan Point Cemetery, but what, because of what is on the other side of the river right here. Uh, that's the Buckland Point Wastewater Treatment Facility. And that is where, when I flush my toilet, I'm pretty sure that's where it ends up. It's one of the two major wastewater treatment facilities in the state of Rhode Island. And like I said, they, they treat wastewater. So the effluent that comes out of there is not, it's obviously not raw sewage. Uh, but it, I, I think this is the pipe that it comes out of right here. So it's entering the river here. Um, and so to me, that seems like a place that maybe there are more antibiotic resistance genes spreading. Uh, next, I was thinking about, um, you know, farms and animal use. Uh, I don't. I live in Rhode Island, so I don't live near any hog farms or, or large cattle ranches or anything. So I, I thought, well, what about the dog park? Um, so I went to the Waterman Street Dog Park in, in Providence, and I took some soil from right about there. Um, you know, this is a place where animals are regularly spreading their bacteria on the ground, you know, even if we pick it up. Uh, you know, there's a lot of animal waste that goes right on the ground there. And I certainly have given my dogs antibiotics uh, at, at different times in their lives. So I thought maybe this is a place that could be particularly enriched for antibiotic resistance. Uh, next, I went to suburbia, to my house, and I uh, went to my lovely flower garden. Uh, give credit where credit is due. My, my wife does most of the gardening in, in this particular garden around our house. But uh, I pushed back a little bit of this mulch here and uh, took a little bit of soil. Just in my head, this seems like a place that maybe is a, a, you know, a little less likely to have antibiotic resistance uh, spreading. Though, I mean, I'll note, uh, you know, there, where there's a bird bath, so there's, you know, plenty of waste going into the environment here. Um, this mulch is just from a large, uh, you know, garden center. So, you know, who knows where, where that comes from and what's in it, but, uh, we'll give that a try. And then finally, I went to a state park near my house. I like to run through here. So I just put a little micro centrifuge tube in my pocket and it picks up some soil on my run. Uh, so this is from the middle of the woods though, you know, with the note, this is a state park in a sort of urban suburban environment. Um, you know, it, this is a picture from the state park. It gets a lot of human recreation use. So it's not some, you know, wild wilderness, yeah, unspoiled land. Um, there's a lot of human use there, but it, it is definitely woods. It definitely is a place that you don't, wouldn't maybe think of antibiotic resistance uh, when you're there. Uh, so you don't need much soil to do this. These are my four samples. Uh, from the river, from Swamp Point, from the dog park, my garden, Lincoln Woods. You just need 250 milligrams of soil, which is a very small amount. I have my uh, microcentrifuge tube here for reference. And then you use a commercial uh, soil extraction uh, protocol. And this is something that we provide with the lab. Uh, the first thing that you do is, is you use a, a bead beater um, so you have this little tube that has, these are silica beads in the bottom and, and you put your soil in there uh, and with some soapy buffer and you just bash it to all heck because we're looking for bacteria. Uh, these are mine about to go into the uh, vortexer. Uh, we're looking for bacteria and depending on the bacteria, some of them have really uh, tough cell walls. So we just want to, you know, bash this to all heck and break open as many cells as we can. Um, Ideally, you, you do this in something called a cell disruptor, which is uh, specifically for shaking tubes like this. Uh, I just used the, the good old Vortex mixer. Uh, you know, you just put it in your adapter there and shake it up. There we go. Uh, though you, for the Vortex mixer, um, according to the, the uh, instructions, you're supposed to go for 40 minutes 
of tube bashing um, to, to get everything uh, broken up in there. So after that, you use a series of spin columns. Uh, these are, again, they come with a kit. They're, uh, they look like this. Uh, you know, you put your liquid in the top, you put in a little centrifuge, and then you take the liquid out, put in a new column, uh, you put a new buffer on, you spin again and again. Uh, it takes uh, 11 different centrifugations. Uh, it takes me, you know, half an hour, 40 minutes to, to pass all these things through. And I'll just show, I, again, I did most of this just in my home living room laboratory. I just use the, the small centrifuge that we sell, uh, you know, just a, a small microfuge. Uh, the, the protocol, you know, asks for a, uh, you know, a, a larger uh, tabletop high speed micro centrifuge, but the, the small ones work as well. Um, so then when you're done, uh, you end up with this nice little tube that looks like this with about 100 microliters of, uh, looks just like water, but it should be chock full of DNA. It's actually so chock full of DNA that before we test it, you dilute it 100 fold. So I take two microliters uh, from this tube uh, here, two microliters from here, and then put it into 200 microliters of uh, purified water before we do any more tests. The test that we're going to do is we're going to do PCR. And we're going to do PCR to amplify three genes. So I already talked to you about the TET A gene that we're going to try to amplify. We're looking for that one. We're also looking for the TET M gene. And then finally, uh, we're also going to look for the 16S ribosomal RNA gene. The ribosomal RNA gene uh, is part of the ribosome or the, the the RNA that that gene codes for makes up part of the small subunit of the ribosome. And so this is there as a control because uh, the, we're using universal primers that should amplify virtually any bacteria. And so this is just to make sure that our DNA extraction worked and that we have some good DNA in there. So we're going to use PCR. Uh, PCR, the polymerase chain reaction, is a, is a method of taking a uh, complex DNA sample, and gosh, a soil extraction is a really complex DNA sample. Who knows what all is in there? Uh, and we're going to be able to zoom in on a, a region of interest, those three genes that I talked about, and uh, using uh, the right ingredients, we're going to be able to make about a billion copies of just uh, those genes. And then we're going to be able to see if we were able to find them. Uh, you do that in a thermal cycler. Uh, if you're not familiar, this is the mini PCR thermal cycler. This is my 16 well thermal cycler, so I have 16 samples in there that I tested. Uh, yeah, so these are small thermal cyclers, uh, fully functional thermal cyclers that uh, program using an app off of a phone or a computer. So I did that. Uh, and then what we did to, just to be clear, the way that you use PCR to find those things is through the primers. So primers are sequences that you design that match the beginning and the end of the sequence that you're interested in. And then in the, in, during PCR, these primers will bind to those pieces of DNA, and from there it will make a copy. If that DNA is present, it will make a copy, and we'll be able to see that later on when we do gel electrophoresis. If the DNA isn't present, it won't make a copy, and it won't be there at the end. So again, we're going to use three different primer sets. We're going to use TET-A primer sets. TET-A amplifies a 210 base pair region of the TET-A gene. Our TET-A sample uh, primer set uh, amplifies a 450 base pair region of the TET-M gene. And that 16S universal primers amplifies 406 base pairs region of what should be, um, should be in virtually all bacteria. So in setting this up, uh, I set up four samples using the TET-A primers, uh, one for each bit of DNA that I extracted. Uh, tubes five through eight, I set up four tubes with the TET-M primers, again, testing each of the four places I got soil from. I tested four samples 
uh, using this, uh, the 16S primer set, looking uh, again at the four places I went. And again, the 16S, I expect that all of these should work. This is a control to make sure that I actually have DNA. Now I note, do another control in here. Uh, as part of this kit, we actually, we send you a plasmid. And that plasmid has prime, the primer uh, sequences on it for the TET-M and the TET-A gene. So that's a way to control that the PCR works for TET-A and TET-M. So I use, in one tube, I use my TET-A primers with the plasmid control. In the other tube, I use my TET-M primers and the plasmid control. And I expect that those should work because I put in the DNA that I know will be there. And then finally, uh, I use both those primers without any DNA. Uh, and because I expect those should not amplify anything. And so we just want to make sure if they're, yeah, that our negatives are true, uh, true negatives, uh, or rather our positives are, are true positives because we, we want to make sure that we don't get any bands, we don't get any product uh, if we don't use DNA. So again, we put it in the thermal cycler. Uh, this is the, it's a, just a pretty standard protocol, 94 degrees, 55 degrees is our annealing temperature and 72 degrees for the extension. We do 35 cycles. Uh, this takes somewhere between an hour and a half and two hours, something like that. And in the end, uh, we're going to run a gel to be able to see our results. So uh, we're going to use gel electrophoresis, which separates uh, samples by size. Uh, and we're going to run each PCR uh, reaction out on a gel to see if something's there. So this is what we're looking for. Uh, in the TET-A sample, TET-A uh, produces a 210 base pair band. So we have our ladder here on the left. If we see a 210 base pair band in our TET-A samples, we know that that gene was present in the soil that we were testing. When we look for TET-M, we're looking for a 450 base pair band. If we see that band in the samples that we were testing using the TET-M primers, we'll know that the TET-M gene was present. For 16S, we expect this to come up for all of them. Uh, we expect to see a 406 base pair band using the 16S primers. We then, uh, on the plasmid, the plasmid is uh, built so that these primers will always amplify a 377 base pair sequence. So just to be clear on that, you're not actually amplifying the TET-A or TET-M genes off of this control. You're just amplifying a piece of DNA that we send you that has the primers in it. So this is just to test whether the primers work. And then finally, for our uh, negative controls, no DNA controls, oops, we expect nothing to be there. Okay, uh, so we run our gels. I ran my gels on gelato. Uh, this is our larger uh, gel electrophoresis system. Uh, you may be familiar with blue gel. This is our smaller electrophoresis system that's, uh, you know, most often found in, uh, more often found in classrooms. Uh, so integrated blue light illumination and electrophoresis all in one. The gelato is a bigger version of this with a little bit more, um, well, you can select different voltages and set timers. There's just a little bit more uh, uh, options on it and it holds a lot more samples. So let's look at my results. All right, let's dive right in. Let's see if I found any TET-A or TET-M spreading in these four places. So lane one is going to be my ladder. We got one, two, three, four, 500 base pairs going up. Uh, so the first four I'm going to look at are for TET-M. I'm sorry, TET-A. <laughs> for TET-A. So TET-A, again, if there's a 200 base pair band, so we're looking somewhere in this range, we have a positive. All right. We see stuff down here. Uh, that's primer dimer. So that's below 100 base pairs. Uh, sometimes when pr there's not anything for the primer to bind to it in the sample, it will sort of bind to itself uh, and, and make a, a sort of fuzzy band down under 100 base pairs. But if we look in the 200 range, it looks pretty darn blank. Okay, So there's in all four places, I don't see any evidence that the TET-A gene is spreading. 
All right, tet m, if we see a positive in the 450 range, so we're looking up around here somewhere, we're looking real, that is going to be mean that the tet m gene is spreading. So let's look at those. All right, so Seekonk River, nothing. Dog Park, that is a clear band right there, right at the expected size. It looks like in the dog park, there is TET-M, the TET-M antibiotic resistance gene is in that soil. Look at this, my garden. A little fainter, but that is there. There is TET-M, the TET-M resistance gene is present in the soil of my garden. Lincoln Woods, nothing. I will note if you if you just squint your eyes, you can see a little band here on Lincoln Woods, uh, kind of higher up on the TED A primers. There's a little stuff going on in some places that can happen. There's these are really complex DNA samples, like I said, and so sometimes you get sort of off-target results, especially if the the thing you're looking for isn't there. The ins the only thing we want to know, though, is is there a band of the correct size? So, uh, you know, sometimes, especially if you have a lot of DNA, you'll get a band that is, or a band or a couple bands that are just completely wrong sizes. Those you ignore, those are negative results. This is a clear positive result. Now, before we can say a clear positive result, though, we got to check our controls. So, let's see. First off, one thing I might want to know two of those samples I'd never got any positives in. So, maybe. I didn't have any DNA in there. That's that could be a thing. So let's look at that. So again, we have our ladder. This is the 16S. If we see a positive here, it just means that there's lots of DNA. We see screaming really bright positives. So we have tons of DNA. That is not an issue. So uh, lack of DNA is not the issue. Uh, our next two do the primers work. So I didn't see any uh, results for TET. Uh, a, so maybe the primer just wasn't good. Well, TED A, here's my plasmid, nice band, right at 377 where I expect it. TED M, same thing. My primers are good. Finally, uh, let's make sure that my negatives are truly negative. Let's look at that. Oh, look at that. That's one of the few times you're really excited to see nothing in your in your lane. Nothing there. Excellent. Beautiful negative result. So, what does that mean? It means I found tetracycline-resistant bacteria, or at least tetracycline-resistant genes, in two places spreading in the environment uh, where I go fairly regularly. The first thing that we want you to do, though, is as part of the PEAR project, we want you to share your results. Um, the, as part of the, the project, there's a website to go to and a, a password to get on, and you go in and, and you put in uh, you know, the, the school you came from, uh, your group, and all your results, and upload a picture of your gel, nicely labeled, so it can go to the anti the pair project. Um, I know I'm someone, I'm always a little uh, hesitant to share. <laughs> I'm always skeptical of my own results and uh, especially skeptical of student results. So I understand why some people may be nervous about putting this out in a database, but all results are looked at by a, a member of the pair team. And, uh, but then they're added to a searchable map. And, and the important thing here is folks know this is coming from student data. Uh, so no one's looking for everything to be, you know, publication quality results. But we, the, one of the goals of this project is to really monitor the environment and use a distributed monitoring approach. And so one of the goals in doing this is to put a dot on the map. Um, we want you to, to fill up this map from the PEAR project. Uh, with all different places that, that you have uh, looked at and say what where you went and what you found. This is really sort of, again, taking part in a, in a larger project with sort of a, a, an important larger mission. Uh, just to show you, uh, to zoom in here, a lot of those places where it looked like there were a lot of dots, there's actually a whole lot of dots from people who have been doing this for a little while. Every one of these is on this map is clickable. You can see this on the pair website. Uh, you can go in, you know, see who who left it, 
where this one came from a farm with cattle and horses. The soil is taken specifically from the cow pen. Um, and so all this will be recorded. And again, this is your chance to have you and your students taking part in a much larger initiative. More specifically interpreting results, I want to uh, just stress again, there is a gene that codes for tetracycline resistance present in the soil that I tested from the dog park and my garden. That's what I found. That's really all I can say here. And I don't want uh, to you know, be implying anything uh, more than that. Uh, that should be alarming. Like that's alarming to me, but really only in like the broader impacts in the idea of, wow, antibiotic resistance really is widespread. Um, it does not mean, so I want to say really clear, it does not mean that any person is at any direct risk of contracting uh, antibiotic resistant infection. I'm not scared to go plant flowers in my garden. I'm going to go back to the dog park. Um, you know, when we did this, we tested for two genes. Um, so in that sense, we're taking a pretty narrow approach. Uh, we picked those genes because they're common, but it also means that negative results, uh, the places that I didn't see anything, it doesn't mean that there isn't no, uh, that there's no antibiotic resistance there. Um, as we said, there's over 40 genes just for tetracycline resistance, and there's resistance to all sorts of other drugs spreading out there. Um, it's also, we chose these because they're known to be widespread. So that I found them isn't particularly concerning. These were picked because we know they're widespread. We know that tetracycline resistance is all over the place. Um, and so that I found them isn't surprising. It's not particularly concerning in terms of these specific areas. Like, yes, again, in the global sense, it's concerning, but the specific result doesn't concern me uh, too much. Um, and it's also important to remember, we don't know what organism these were in. Um, it's actually unlikely that they were in a pathogenic bacteria. So, right, so all of, we, when we take antibiotics, we're enriching all antibi all by, uh, I'm sorry, all bacterial populations for antibiotic resistance. So uh, no idea what this was, and it, it's, it's unlikely that something that could even make you sick. And just finally, I want to say there are other resistance genes, especially those to those sort of like last line of defense antibiotics, that if we found those, it would be particularly alarming. Again, in that that we that these things are spreading and it part, would be particularly concerning for some drugs. We didn't test for those. Um, so it's just important to keep all of that in perspective as we look at those results. I, I want to sort of finish up in, in what to do about this. Um, it's important to uh, monitor the problem. It's also important, I think, to inspire action. It's a bit of a paradox, right? Uh, the more we use antibiotics, the more there will be resistance. Uh, and that's because natural selection, right? It works on, uh, it can, natural selection can only work if you're using antibiotics. So if you use antibiotics less, natural selection won't work, you won't be enriching populations for antibiotic resistance. Uh, the paradox is, right, antibiotics are, are wonderful drugs. They have done wonders for humanity. Uh, and so they're good to use. Um, but to, to keep them effective, we have to limit their use. Some of that comes at the public health level. Um, you know, public health uh, officials are, are constantly talking about, you know, ways to possibly cycle which antibiotics people use, using only certain antibiotics for certain drugs, I'm sorry, for certain uh, infections, and trying to spread it on a large scale. But it does mean on a personal sense that, um, you know, you should only take antibiotics when necessary uh, and following dosage dress recommendations. So it's important not to ask your doctor for antibiotics, um, right? If they, if they say you should take them, you should take them, but take them in the, in the method that they're prescribed. And then finally, it's important to use less antibiotics in agriculture. The fact that uh, antibiotics are so widespread in agriculture, um, again, it makes it more dangerous for humans because these antibiotic uh, resistant elements have the potential to spread. Uh, there is some movement in this way. Uh, it's uh, Antibiotics are definitely in less use, 
uh, than they used to be. There are laws concerning that, uh, like a lot of laws, there's some loopholes, um, but it is something that, that is important to, to pursue going forward as well. Um, so with that, I'm pretty much wrapped up. There were some questions that I just want to, that people put in um, in signing up for this that I want to address. The first, um, is antibiotic resistance a threat to vaccines? Uh, obviously, vaccines are in everyone's mind right now. Um, a great question, and I just want to be really clear. Vaccines and antibiotics are completely different approaches, okay? Um, vaccines prepare your immune system to defeat um, a, a pathogen, usually a virus, uh, and antibiotics are taken to uh, kill bacteria that are, inf that are causing an infection. Really importantly, especially if you're thinking about the coronavirus vaccine, um, antibiotics do not work on viruses. Antibiotics work on bacteria. Viruses are something completely different. So antibiotic resistance has nothing to do with, with viruses. Um, yeah, I, I will say just briefly, uh, you know, resistance, uh, uh, viruses can evolve in a way to escape uh, uh, the vaccines we use. And so in that sense, there is natural selection for the uh, both things to evolve, to escape the mechanisms that we're using to defeat them. But the two mechanisms, vaccines, antibiotics, completely different, and they treat different things and in different ways. Uh, how's antibiotic resistance spread? So I, I'm going to dive into this just in a little bit more detail if people want a little bit uh, more on this because I, I think it's fascinating. Uh, so we said that it's spread horizontally, but there's actually two main ways it's spread. Um, the first is through plasmids. And if you've worked in a microbiology lab, uh, you're probably familiar with uh, plasmids. It's, uh, we use them to pass DNA elements into uh, like E. coli in the lab. That's uh, how we make a lot of proteins in the lab. Uh, plasmids are small circular uh, bacteria, uh, I'm sorry, small circular DNA elements that are outside the chromosome. They are pretty common in bacteria. They're also present in some other types of organisms as well. But specifically, plasmids uh, specialize in being passed horizontally. And likewise, uh, once they pass horizontally, uh, then they can pass vertically. Uh, they do this, uh, a lot of uh, plasmids have genes on them that actually cause or lead to bacteria to fuse uh, through conjugation and pass DNA elements uh, across cell membranes in that way. Um, or they can just be picked up from the environment through transformation. Really importantly, um, because uh, plasmids usually carry something that's beneficial to the organism, that something that helps them get past. So the uh, things that are beneficial to the organism through natural selection tend to end up on plasmids. So plasmids tend to gather um, these antibiotic resistance genes, and there's many plasmids out there spreading that have many antibiotic resistance genes on them. And as they spread, they confer resistance to new bacteria. Um, another major way is through uh, transposable elements. Transposable elements are DNA elements that are on the chromosome. Um, and they work by making a copy of themselves or cutting themselves out and jumping to another part of the chromosome. Uh, that happens in you or in humans. Uh, it happens in all sorts of organisms. Uh, though in bacteria, they actually are able to um, you know, hop out and jump to another bacteria entirely and then insert themselves in the chromosome. Uh, again, then they get passed on quite stably in a vertical manner. And just like plasmids, um, because uh, uh, you know, natural selection favors things that, that aid in the survival uh, of organisms, these, um, these uh, transposable elements tend to collect antibiotic resistance or other favorable genes that they can then pass from one to the other. And so from a natural selection standpoint, it's important to remember uh, that when this happens, this transmission of antibiotic resistance happens in, I mean, it happens in just the addition of one gene. If you get one element 
all of a sudden, boom, you're completely resistant, or at least very strongly resistant. It's it's less something where we often think of natural selection working on something slowly, mutation by mutation. Once one of these things hops into a new place, you got resistance and you can't kill it anymore. Uh, so finally, people have just asked about implementation. So has this been implemented? Yes, absolutely. Um, should really, and I hope I did at the front, give a, a, a good shout out to the pair project where a lot of this uh, has come from. Uh, people who are part of the pair project have been implementing this module uh, in their uh, classes, mostly at the college level already. Um, what we're trying to do is take something that they've been doing and, and help it um, be distributed more widely. Um, and we have done that. We've had um, several beta testers for this uh, in high school classrooms who have used it. Uh, again, it's great, absolutely great as like a project-based approach. We've had a, a few people, um, you know, sort of a science fair type project where uh, a small group of students has taken this and, and gone and surveyed specific places. Uh, if you're interested in doing that, uh, we are planning on launching this kit soon. It's been in development for a little bit, a little while now. The goal is, uh, well, we're going to have it out by this fall. So if you're interested in doing it in the next school year, uh, we'll have it uh, out by then. Now, hopefully later this summer is when uh, it, it will be launched and for sale on the website. Uh, so with that, thank you all uh, for joining me today. Thanks for giving me your time. Uh, I, I hope you learned something. I, I hope you found this interesting. Uh, again, thank you to the Pair Project, who's uh, sort of entrusted us in um, you know helping to distribute their curriculum more widely. And uh, with that, thanks a lot, and have a lovely day.